Welcome to this new video lecture for the course Multimodal Communication. This is the fifth video lecture introducing the concept and research area of multimodality. So far we've discussed how multimodality and semiotic modes are defined, where they originate and in which situations they occur. With this we have summarized the theoretical part of the underlying textbook. This lecture now gives practical instructions how to apply the theory to actual analyses. It will bridge between the theoretical categories introduced in the other lectures and particular analytical decisions of how to approach and deal with multimodal phenomena of all kinds. Given that this course is mostly theory based, we skip two important chapters of the textbook, the one on methods, and the other on statistical calculations. These chapters introduce the primary methods that have been developed or applied across various disciplines and that are very useful for the analysis of any problem of multimodality. All these methods are generally applicable to broad ranges of multimodal investigations and the overview in chapter 5 is given from a very broad or interdisciplinary perspective without any disciplinary habit in mind. I can only urgently recommend to read through these chapters and familiarize yourself with the methods you would like to apply in your analysis. In this lecture, the focus will be on how to characterize any object or situation under investigation so that it may be approached for a detailed multimodal analysis. For this, we will be setting out a navigator that directs your attention to those aspects of a multimodal artifact or performance that will add in its analysis. It is then your task to go back to the methods chapters in order to choose an appropriate method to work with in this analysis. So, while we have looked at many theoretical concepts and definitions in the last lectures, and then always discussed some prototypical examples in more or less initial analyses, we will now approach the task from the other end and start with concrete situations, artifacts or performances, and draw on the theoretical foundations. We will always do this from a use perspective so that we can apply it to any other concrete case immediately or whenever needed. The textbook discusses a complex situation in a classroom where teacher and students interact with each other and with several other media. In this lecture, we will analyze the communicative situation of a business meeting as depicted here. Note that the image of the meeting on this slide is of course a static permanent artifact that only represents the dynamic fleeting face-to-face -face interaction. For a concrete analysis of such an interaction, it is of course necessary to have the relevant data at hand, for example with access to a corpus of recordings of such meetings. So for our analysis here, the precise details of the content of this business meeting will not be our focus. We will only be concerned with how to go about organizing the data that such a situation provides. When we have such an orientation and organization, it will then be much easier to do more content-based analyses. The image we have here could be an abstract version of a still taken from a video recording of this meeting. It gives us access to the participants and their verbal interaction, their gestures and actions when writing on the laptop or using the tablets. Ideally, we would also have some data from the devices used and the products resulting from this meeting. And this is then already a lot of material that we need to organize. A first step towards this organization is to sort out the media and its canvases in this situation. In order to describe the media and canvases included, we start with the most inclusive and then go to the most specific. The most inclusive media establishes the most powerful or expressive virtual canvas that will be available for any further analysis. All other canvases that we can identify will be embedded in this inclusive canvas. 
think about this most inclusive canvas as a space of possibilities for perception and action. A space where materials and actions can be seen, heard, felt, or even smelt. Each canvas of the situation under analysis is then one slice through an overall space, as it is depicted here. The overall ball is the complete space of possibilities that some inclusive canvas provides. Each sub-canvas holds a restricted range of possibilities within that complete space. Different slices are of course possible. For our business meeting situation, we begin with addressing the situation as a whole, which is a three-dimensional space that unfolds in real time, very similar to the classroom situation described in the textbook. The participants are important in this space because they bring this communicative situation into being by contributing with all sorts of communication. The medium can then be described as mutable ergodic, dynamic, and involving participants that perform communicative activities of various kinds. This is why we usually call this a performance and not an artifact. As a next step, we can now decompose the situation of this business meeting further. For this, it is useful to look at the communicative activities that might be performed in this situation. And here it might be helpful to look at research on team meetings and the typical structure of such meetings, a potential hierarchical organization of speakers, etc. All of the activities that can be identified within this specific meeting can then draw on their own slices through the perceptual possibilities provided by the canvas. We can, for example, take a closer look at the interaction of a participant with the tablet, which will most likely show a two-dimensional permanent static artifact, such as a document with notes. We can also have a look at the interaction between these two participants, looking at another screen and possibly also interacting with it. While their verbal interaction is three-dimensional, fleeting, dynamic and immutable ergodic, the artifact they are interacting with is most likely again rather static. By focusing on the different activities and combinations of media, we similarly identify different slices and their carrying canvases. And we can do this for several further such media and canvases in this situation. We can, for example, look at the laptop screen or the tablet and find a website there that builds an artifact to be analyzed multimodally. If we find out who is the moderator of this meeting, we could also have a closer look at their interaction with several other participants and at specific gestures, body postures, etc. What we see here is basically that each canvas is lifted out of its embedding within the base canvas, which supports the activity as a whole. For each of these canvases, we can think of further sub-canvases that might again be lifted out of their embedding, etc., etc. We should then also label these canvases and of course describe their basic characteristics with the categories we introduced in Lecture 3. Only if we have decomposed our situation of interest, we can move on to do analyses. These analyses are now much more feasible, since we have a clear and explicit basis to say what kinds of analysis are going to be relevant for this situation. For each canvas, we can then, for example, ask for schemes of description that have already been developed within a specific research area or disciplines. For all things related to the verbal interaction on these canvases, we should, for instance, take into consideration the analysis of verbal forms, as offered by linguistics and conversation analysis. We should, of course, also look at gesture studies to be able to say more about the gestures and body postures used in this situation. For the artifacts produced with a laptop or tablet, we should consider work on page layout and the structure of documents or information about how web pages are usually constructed. Moving further to analyses, we should then always refine all slices and their sub-canvases 
to make clearer what kinds of meaning-making processes we are dealing with. We can do this by actively using the categories and terminologies from Chapter 3. And by using this terminology from Chapter 3 with the systematic overview, we can characterize every sub-canvas in more detail in terms of the media that they support, and we can show the particular properties of each canvas. We will then also directly be able to think about some typical modes being available for and within these canvases, such as the semiotic mode of page layout as driving the composition of a web page or textbook page. And with this, we make one further step towards analyses. We connect with particular methods and tools that have dealt with these media and modes before. And this is exactly what is meant with the navigator function. By decomposing the situation and by describing the canvases and modes, you immediately end up in a research context in which, hopefully, a lot of works have been published that help you finding the right method to do your analysis. Of further help for this could also be the final systematics of use case areas that are all covered by the textbook in the individual use case chapters. In fact, the textbook provides 10 different analytical chapters that all deal with some specific canvas and the semiotic modes in this canvas. It should usually be possible to compare those analyses with others. As an introduction to these use case areas, the book provides an overview of the decision processes necessary to describe a canvas. The first decision is whether the canvas of the communicative situation intrinsically includes spatial dimensions, such as spatial distance or spatial connectedness or proximity. If no spatial extent is available, then we know that the canvas has to be organized intrinsically in time, since otherwise there would be nothing to make meaning from. No manipulable material would exist. Media that only make use of variation, variation in time include, for example, radio programs or music in its simplest form. The second decision to make is whether intrinsic temporal variations may be employed or not. If there is some temporal variation, we usually talk about dynamic situations that typically include film, dance, face-to-face -face interaction. If there is no temporal variation, we have static spatial situations, such as page, page documents. You can see here that there are again more categories added to this decision tree, such as the idea that a canvas can be either freely used or that it is based on a more designed document. We also sometimes use the terminology of scripted and unscripted canvases. And we describe whether the canvas supports some sort of interaction, speaking of interactive or non-interactive situations. The numbers you see here at the bottom of the systematics are the groups in which the use case chapters are organized in the book. As a temporal unscripted situation, for example, we discuss face-to-face -face interaction with a specific focus on gestures, while a theater performance is an example for a more scripted temporal use case. Comics are usual spatial static artifacts, as we've seen in Lecture 4, while websites and dynamic infographics have a temporal extent and are therefore spatial dynamic artifacts. And finally, spatial temporal interactive situations are those in video games. So, when addressing similar situations in your project, you should always go back to, the, to these use case chapters in the textbook to see some initial analyses and further references to existing work on these canvases and modes. With this now, we've discussed all practical navigation tools of Chapter 7 that are intended to guide you from the basic description of communicative situations to comprehensive analyses of multimodal artifacts and performances. One final thing in order to do effective multimodal research is then this list of eight steps to manage a complete piece of such effective multimodal analysis. We organize these steps in three main analytical phases. 
The first phase addresses the overall design of the study and considers which materials are going to be relevant. For this one selects a class of communicative situations and chooses a particular focus to be adopted within this situation. One also decomposes the media in order to hierarchically organize the canvases and subcanvases for the analysis. And one finds out more about the general genre space in which the multimodal situation is taking place. This is then the phase of identifying multimodality in your analytical objects. In the second phase, one collects data that is fitting to your research question or interest, and one identifies in the data the activities being performed and the semiotic modes being used. For this, it is always helpful and necessary to triangulate one's own research with existing works on these situations or modes. This is the phase of the actual analysis, best done on the basis of a corpus. The final and third phase then examines the results of the analysis by finding patterns and explanation to these patterns, which are then finally written up. This is the phase of evaluation and writing. Following these steps systematically will definitely get your multimodal research project going. With this overview, we can also, now at the end of this lecture, summarize the most important terms you should have learned in these lectures and which you should be able to apply to your individual analysis. For a comprehensive multimodal analysis, it is always necessary to start with the broad communicative situation you're dealing with. In this communicative situation, a specific focus lies on the media of the situation and their canvases and subcanvases, with which you also determine the focus of your analysis. When you've analyzed the communicative situation, the media and the canvases, you can then finally identify the semiotic modes at work on the canvases and in the situation. These terms and concepts are applicable to all sorts of multimodal artifacts and performances. When dealing with a specific example, it is thus always helpful to take this navigator chapter as guidelines for your analysis. Part three of the book then gives the many different case studies that we have shortly discussed before. They all follow the steps described here and expand on recent research for each of the artifacts or performances described. This is a profound basis for any interest in multimodal analysis. As we say in the summary of the textbook, be a multimodalist, have fun and explore. Thank you for your attention.